would have been written if the church didn't need rebuking. Lord, today, would you please give us your heart. Lord, wake us up. It's already been said here today. We're tired of playing church. We're tired of going through the motions. Lord, we need your Holy Spirit. We need your heart for others. We need to stop uh, uh, bickering and talking and gossiping. Lord, we need to be about your business. And so, Lord, today, would you just take over? Would you be the one doing the speaking here today and the convicting here today? And, Lord, uh, we believe that when we surrender our lives and our church to you, Lord, we're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit like never before in this place. And I know, Lord, that's what we want and that's what we've been praying for. So help us. Be with us now and speak to us in a powerful way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'll start out this way. Uh, Hoel Jr. and I have been messaging each other. He uh, is uh, one of the writers for uh, one of the columns at Southern. And he's asking me to help him find some statistics about the Adventist church. So I helped him. And um, while I was looking for some statistics, I found something. And I was like, Hoel, you got to use this. And he's going to use this. And I told him, I'm going to use this too. It's a, it's a statistic that was recently put out by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It's called Those Who Leave. And uh, that's very, very small print. But uh, it says there that uh, since 1965, the Adventist Church has seen 37, 37 million people. 37 million people come to become Adventist Christians. That's a big amen, right? Here's where it gets really sad. It says that, and that's very hard. I know you can't read that. But it says that 40%, 40% of those we baptize, 15 million of those leave the church within a year or two. 15 million people between 1965 and now. We've gained 37 million, but we've lost 40% of those people. Man, let me tell you, church, that's really hard to see. And we know that that's true because we see it, I think, even in our context. And one of the things this study shows is one of the biggest reasons why people leave the church is, and there's many reasons, but one of the biggest reasons why people leave the church is because they were never discipled and never given a chance to show that they have a place in the church. There was never a place for them in the church. They were never given a place. And let me tell you guys, that's on us. That's on leadership. That's on church. We have to make sure that People have a place to serve and people have a place to use their gifts and be discipled to follow Jesus. Amen? We don't want that to happen and we don't want anybody to be a statistic. As long as we're, it's under our watch, we don't want that to happen to anybody, right? And so I hope that you sense the urgency of this message. This is part two of our spiritual gifts message. Like we talked about last week, this, this um, um, we called it an S. It's one of the eight S's. We talked about that last week too. This subject is critically important to the unity and to the mission and to the future of our church. Let me give you a second warning here today. Today's message is very different. We're going to ask you to participate at the end of this message. And now don't be scared. Don't be running away. It's not painful, okay? This participation is not painful. But we're going to participate. We're going to ask you, and we're going to ask the children, we're going to ask the adults, everybody to participate today. Because we don't want this to be our story, right? We don't want this to be our story. We want to, to make sure everybody, everybody uh, can have a place and feel like they have a place within this movement. So I hope you guys understand this urgency. We don't want this to happen. God forbid this to happen in our context. Amen? I don't know about you guys, but I'm tired of seeing people leave. We have such a beautiful church. It's such a beautiful truth that it is in Jesus. And when people leave, it's sad. And I guarantee all of us here have a family member or friend and or friend that have people that have left this church. I have pastors who graduated me with me. I had a huge class at Southern graduate with me in my, in my class become pastors. And many of them have not just left pastoring. Many of them have left church. I'm tired of that. And it makes me sad. It saddens me more than anything. And, you know, sometimes they say you don't make a change until the change, until it's painful enough to change. And, and, and I say, man, I'm tired of that change. I'm tired of that pain, right? 
I want things to change. And I want it to change here at Phil M. Amen? Amen? So let's gonna go, we're going to go back. We're going we're gonna to do a working, um, a, a working definition of what a spiritual gift is. I'm going to give you a working definition. A spiritual gift is a God-given ability to serve the church and its mission effectively. Spiritual gift is a God-given ability to serve the mission, serve the church and its mission effectively. Now, if you remember last week, if you were here last week, we saw that the Bible has a gift for everyone. Every believer, everyone who is a follower of Christ, everybody has a gift. And and we looked at another scripture last week that said, not only do we have a gift, but there's a plea for you that if you have a gift, don't just keep it at home. God God has given you that gift so that you can bless others with it. And so there's a plea, please, please use it for God's glory. Not for your own, not for your attention, not so that people can say, oh, what a great Christian she is. Oh, what a great Adventist person she, he is. But so that people can give glory to God because of you. That's your spiritual gift. So, all right, let's go to our text. We're going to go to a couple texts here today. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 4, please. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to start in verse 12. Uh, right before verse 12, we're talking about spiritual gifts. It even lists some spiritual gifts. So we're going to jump right into verse 12 because we're going to look at what happens, the vision of a church of what happens when people use their spiritual gift. When, when, a, when a group of people discover and use their spiritual gift, look what happens. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12. We're going to start in verse 12. But we're going to go to verse 16. And if you're with me, say amen. Verse 12. This is what happens for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love, may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Ephesians four twelve to 16. So what happens, church? Look at this. What happens As believers are equipped to use their gifts and given space to use their gifts, what happens to the church and what happens to the individual? Watch this. Look at verse 13. Notice what happens. Verse 13, what's the outcome of people in a church using their gifts? The outcome is unity. So the implication is when there is division, why is there division? Because people aren't using their gifts. Because people aren't being equipped or using their gifts, they're not working together. So spiritual gifts are the remedy to division. Whenever there's something that's not right, it's because we're not participating together. We're not working together. So spiritual gifts is so important for us to work together and to discover and to have unity amongst the body. Look at verse 13 also. What happens as people are equipped to use their gifts? What happens, verse 13? Individuals become more perfect, meaning more like Christ. There's another way to say more perfect in Scripture. It means more mature. Thank you, I just heard it. More mature. In fact, the Bible says no longer acting like kids. No longer acting like infants. Did you guys know that that it's not just kids or infants described in the Bible in the church? That the church describes even adults sometimes as kids? Because we haven't grown up yet? And so it's described, it's describing us as kids. It's almost saying, hey, come on guys, you guys want to really grow up? You guys want to grow up? You guys want to stop complaining maybe? Because by the way, only those who, only those who are, are on the bench complain. Those on the trenches don't complain. Only those on the bench. Only spectators complain. So you guys want to be more mature? Well then, come to know and use your spiritual gift. Right? That's what it says. Look at verse 14. No longer tricked by false doctrine? That's crazy. Like, think about that. That's what we just read in Scripture. No longer tricked by false doctrine. So how... How do we go about no longer getting tricked by false doctrine? Well, 
typical Adventist might think, well, we just have to study more. We just have to attend more Bible studies. That's not what we just read in Ephesians 4. Do you guys understand? Look at this. Because, by the way, belief and action always go together. So it's amazing. The Bible says, you know how to get your doctrine right? Don't just study. Typical Adventists might think, don't just study. Use your gifts and serve. Don't just do mental gymnastics. Serve. And that's why I think, and by the way, I might get hammered for this right now, but hear me out. That's why I think, and I'm about to propose, I think all Sabbath school classes should take one Sabbath where they don't study. I told you you won't like that. Let me say that again. I think all Sabbath school classes should take one Sabbath every now and then and don't study. I'll give you an example here in a little bit. Instead of that day studying, I think all Sabbath school classes should take a day where they don't study and they go out and they serve. If you remember one of the first, I think, uh, uh, anniversaries we had here, I brought in my friend Anthony Wagner Smith. You guys remember, uh, he's a dynamite speaker. He's helped uh, bring about a lot of church, planted a lot, plant a lot of churches. And in his church in Tampa, guess what? Once a quarter, once a quarter, Sabbath school would close. You know what they would do? All of those Sabbath school classes would take a mission in the Tampa area, and they would all go out Sabbath morning, and they would serve the community. You know, when people, when people, and by the way, I'm not mocking Sabbath school. I'm just saying what the Bible is saying, right? You know, you know what people will say after that Sabbath, particularly that Sabbath of service, instead of coming and being fed, like that song said, right? How can we be so dead when we've been so well fed? You know what those people say? I grew more and I learned more about that Sabbath of service than I did sitting in a classroom. That's not me being crazy, guys. That's Ephesians chapter 4. It says that if we, do, if we, if we no longer want to be swept away by, by, by uh, wrong doctrine, we got to go out and we got to use our gifts and we got to serve people. And some people may think that's crazy, but that's biblical. Hey, by the way, I'm going to stop right now and tell you, I'm giving you guys permission today to speak to me. Can you guys talk to me here? So some people think that's a crazy idea. That's not a crazy idea. That's a biblical idea. So Sabbath school teachers, I hope you're listening to me. I will get you in trouble. But if any one of you guys are hearing me here today, I want you to have permission to stop your class every now and then and go out and serve with your class. Go out and do something outside of this, of these four walls and go serve. Verse 16, look at, look at, look at what happens when we use our gifts. Look what happens, church. Verse 16, what does it say? What becomes stronger? What grows? It causes growth for the body of the edifying of itself in love. It grows not just by people, but they grow in love for each other and for Christ. When people serve, when people use their gifts for Christ, they don't just grow numerically, they grow spiritually. Don't you guys want that? Man, I think of that. that's the whole point of why we're here. The whole point of why we're here is because we want to grow spiritually. Yes, we want to grow numerically. That's great. We want to grow numerically, but we want to grow spiritually. We want to grow in all of those ways. So how does that sound to you? All of those things in Ephesians 4. How does unity sound to you? Maturity in love. Hey, we, don't, we no longer hold grudges towards each other. We actually learn to forgive each other. How does that sound? You, uh, maturity in doctrine. Man, we're growing in our knowledge of Christ because we're using our gifts. How does that sound? How does growth in the body sound? It sounds pretty good, right? That's why, church, that's why I want you to know as long as we're here, you guys are going to hear messages about spiritual gifts. Even though, like I told you last week, this is the message that I get most eyes like this, glazed over. Like, oh, man, you're just telling us what to do. You're just telling us what to do. No, 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 no. Spiritual gifts is way more important than someone coming up in here and saying, come on, guys, let's get active. Let's get busy. No, we all know, too, that busyness can be something that the devil uses, too. 
We're talking about being active for Christ, using your spiritual gifts for the Lord, and He getting the, glo- the glory for it. Amen? You're going to hear from this from us every year a sermon or two about spiritual gifts. So I hope you get used to it. Amen? Christianity is not a spectator sport. It's a call to battle. It's a call to action. And I don't want us to be spiritually dead. Okay, Ephesians chapter 4. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Here we go. Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. And I told you guys, sometimes I bear my, my soul too much. But I told you guys, I grew up in church. That's why I'm always, whenever I say I reference not playing church, I grew up in church. And my dad was a pastor. I saw it. Even growing up, I saw that, man, too many, too many people in church are playing church. We got we to gotta be on fire. We got to stop coming here and just finding complaints. And, and I, by the way, I'm not picking on hip things they'll fill out. I'm, I'm talking about everybody, right? And we got to stop talking about, oh, well, the, the sermon wasn't that good. All oh, the music wasn't that good. It's not about that. It's not about that. So we don't come here to watch a show. We don't come here to be spectators, right? We come here because we're all fighting a battle. And this is the place where we get encouragement and we get strength and we get food so we can fight another battle this week, this coming week, right? Man, don't, don't pretend that you guys aren't fighting a battle. I know all of you guys are fighting a battle. I talk to you guys during the week. So this is why we come. We don't come to watch. We don't come to have a spectator sport. Amen. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 6. You guys in the Bible with me? Say amen. amen. For as we have many members in one body. Man, this is some big implications, guys. But all the members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Now, this may be a very familiar passage to many of you, but we don't sometimes look at the implications to this right here in Romans chapter 12. Do we really understand what this means? I mean, really? I'll give you an illustration. Uh, Many of you probably don't know this, but I help coach the middle school basketball, middle school girls basketball team. I love it because Mika's there, Lara's there, Layla's there. I think that's who in Phil M, right? And uh, so I get the privilege of helping coach these girls. And I'm an assistant coach, so sometimes I'm just shooting baskets or getting the basketballs. And this particular day, on Tuesday, right before the game, I was, my responsibility was to get the girls warmed up. So I had the girls all shooting layups, and on the other side, I was shooting a basketball with my son, Jacob. And just for like 10 minutes, maybe not even 10 minutes, I was just shooting the basketball, just I love shooting basketball, by the way. It's the only thing I can do well, I think, is shoot the basketball. And so I was shooting the basketball, and man, after 10 minutes, by the way, I was wearing these shoes because I had to dress up for a meeting later on that day. So I was wearing these shoes. Bad idea, right? So I wasn't even really jumping that high. I was just shooting, barely shooting, not even a jump shot. It was more like a set shot. Man, let me tell you, after 10 minutes, my ankle was hurting so bad. And it was so tender, and it was so gimpy. You could ask Jeff. I saw him on Tuesday night, and he was like, Pastor Glenn, are you okay? Because I was walking like this. I was just like, man, I'm getting too old for this. And my ankle was screaming to the rest of my body. You're getting too old for this. Stop it. You know, and so my ankle was affecting my entire body. It was affecting my entire body for two days. I was walking around with a, with a, with a bruised up ankle. And it reminded me of how old I was getting. Jeff is smiling. And I look at this and I think, man... Those members of the body that we don't even think of sometimes, when they're out of whack, when they're not doing so well, it actually affects the rest of our body. And it says here, if we are Christ's body, that means that every member matters. And when there's a member, when there's a member of the body and they're out of whack, they're hurting, they're not doing so well, it affects all the rest of us. Do we guys know how deep that is? That's a, that's a huge, huge implication for church. But that's the metaphor that Christ used. We are the body. That means that all of us here are as important as the other. So when one member is doing well, 
Man, it really affects the rest of us, right? But one member is hurting, it affects the rest of us. Every member matters. Do we understand that, church? In fact, just to make sure you guys understand with me, could you say that with me? Every member matters. I want, I want, to, I want you to say it like, 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 so I can believe you, okay? Every member matters. Again, again. Every from the youngest to the oldest. Every member matters. Romans chapter 12. That's what it is saying. You can't go around on a gimpy ankle for too long. So let's be clear. Spiritual gifts by review. Spiritual gifts summary. It's given for service to others. It is given to help us become united. It is given to protect us from false doctrine. It is given to help us become closer to Christ, closer to each other, so that the body of Christ can grow, not just numerically, but spiritually, and it allows the church to grow and function as a body. Man, spiritual gifts are so important, guys. It is so important. We don't talk about this enough. What are spiritual, what spiritual gifts are not? There's some confusion here. I'll just cover this very quickly. What spiritual gifts are not? Spiritual gifts are not gifts of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5. I bet some of the kids know the gifts of the Spirit. Can, can anyone tell me? The gifts of the Spirit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness. I'm missing a few. And temperate, yeah, self-control, right? And so if you, look at, if you look at the gifts of the Spirit, they are not spiritual gifts. Gifts of the Spirit are what's happening inside of you. They are character traits. It's what God has given you inside, right? They're changing your character. Spiritual gifts are what people can see. Gifts of the Spirit are what happens inside. They can see the effects of it, but they can't really see that you're becoming more loving and more patient, right? They just see the effects of it. So spiritual gifts are not gifts of the Spirit. Spiritual gifts, this is where it's probably most confused. Spiritual gifts are not talents. They're not talents. Now, you can be born with something. You can be born, inherently born with a talent, but that doesn't mean it's a spiritual gift, a talent, we like to say a talent is something you are born with. A spiritual gift is something you're given when you're born again. Amen. Talents are um, natural. Spiritual gifts are supernatural. Talents can be used to promote self. Spiritual gifts can only be used to glorify God. Now that's very important. I'm going to say that again. Talents can be used... To promote self or to make you look good or to win American Idol. But spiritual gifts can only be used to glorify God. So here's the question. Can talents become spiritual gifts? Are we thinking? Can talents become spiritual gifts? Absolutely. It can. But it's also very dangerously, also very dangerously cannot. Right? Right? So let's take teaching, for example. Maybe somebody, and teaching is obviously a spiritual gift. We looked at the 21 spiritual gifts last week. Teaching is obviously a spiritual gift. It's listed there. But you could be a talented teacher. And people just rave at your knowledge and rave at your gift. But in order to take that talent to become a spiritual gift, then you use that teaching ability to glorify God and help people become closer to, to, to God, right? And to show Christ in a clearer way. That's the gift of teaching when it comes to your spiritual gift. What about singing? Singing always comes up whenever we talk about spirit, or music in general. So you say you have the gift of music, and you believe that's a talent. Can that gift of music become a spiritual gift? Absolutely, right? If it doesn't just, if it doesn't just, uh, uh, if it's not pointing to you, if it's not just bringing attention to you, but instead it's blessing others, and it's, and it's blessing people and bringing them closer to Christ, then that gift, that singing gift or that music gift can be a spiritual gift. Are we clear? The talents are not necessarily spiritual gifts. You know, I love this story. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know who Helen Keller is. I love Helen Keller. Um, I read some of her books when I was growing up. And I, I love the story of Helen Keller. You know, Helen Keller as a baby, what an inspirational person, but as a baby... She was deaf and she was blind as a baby. 
Yet all, throughout her life, and this was a long time ago, she traveled to 39 different countries teaching, writing books, and uh, speaking to people, and advocating for social issues. She made such a huge difference in the world, and she didn't, she wasn't even able to see or hear. And I love, this is her most famous, famous quote, you may have heard it. She says, I am only one, but still, I am one. I cannot do everything, but still, I can do something. I will not refuse to do something I can do do and she made a huge difference in this world the world will never be the same because of helen keller died just before her 88th birthday and she was a strong believer by the way in christ and she used her god-given gifts church family imagine if everyone took what helen keller just said said hey i can't do everything but i can do something can you imagine if every believer in every church said I refuse to not do the something that I can do. And every church said, you know what? If there's one thing I can do, if there's just one thing I can do for God, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it for Him. Man, our churches, our world, our families, our homes would never be the same, would not be the same if we did that and we practiced her advice. So church, every member matters. And and we we mean that. We want to practice that. And today, as we've already told you, It's going to be a little different.